Our next session is called Subversions, a discussion on Shashi Deshpande's latest work, a collection of essays titled Subversion, Essays on Life and Literature. Shashi Deshpande, as we all know, is a novelist and short story writer who has written 11 novels, two crime novellas, a number of short story collections, a book of essays, a memoir, and four children books to her credit. She is the winner of the Sahitya Academy Award and the Padma Shri in 2008. She will be in conversation with Indra Chandrasekhar, who is a scientist, writer, literary curator, and founder and principal editor of Out of Print magazine. With that, over to you. Thank you. And uh, welcome everyone to this important session with uh, writer Shashi Deshpande. Um, it's a session that offers us a unique window into the life and thinking of one of the most important, significant writers uh, in uh, contemporary modern India. So it's really an honor. Thank you. <laughs> well, quickly, before we get into the session, I just want to say that the BLF sessions are generally sharp and short, and the schedule is tight. And so we'll have 10 minutes for audience questions at the end. Uh, and so uh, through this next um, half hour, 40 minutes of conversation, please think of your questions and think of ways to make them concise and succinct. So we will have more of Ms. Deshpande's response and less of uh, your ideas in that sense, <laughs> if you don't mind. So generally, when I'm an interlocutor, I like to uh, say a few words just to contextualize and give a sense of uh, the speaker and uh, their work. Um, but this time I'll be a little brief because really you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from Ms. Deshpande. And, uh, and of course, her formidable list of uh, publications can be accessed uh, through links for, from the Bangalore Literature Fe uh, uh, Festival website and you can hear, learn more about her. But what I do want to draw attention to, I think, is that Ms. Deshpande took the important step of resigning as a mark of protest from the Council of the Sahitya Academy following the assassination and murder of writer uh, M.M. Kalbogi for his ideas. And so it should come as no surprise really that in this book of essays, Subversions, uh, which we are going to mainly be focusing on. The first essay is called Writer as an Activist. But of course, Ms. Deshpande, being the writer and thinker that she is, it's not a big hand-waving uh, argument for being an activist. It's an examination, analytic, thoughtful, about uh, who a writer is in the context of what they're trying to say. Um, so we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, Ms. Deshpande, it's a privilege and an honor to be sitting with you, a writer, a woman, a writer in English, a writer in India, and I thank you very much. Thank you. And read along with your recent memoir, Listen to Me, I think subversions uh, and Listen to Me together give me the feeling that I have the pleasure of following the development of your thinking as a writer throughout your life. And so it's really a privilege and such a generous thing to be available for, for us as writers and readers. Not at all. <laughs> so thank you. So the essay, the book of essays, Subversions, uh, has a number of wonderful essays. But I am um, just going to tell the audience that since this is the Bangalore Literature Festival, now we're going to focus on essays that are about writing and reading. And I thought the first sentence of your first essay in the collection, um, which we already know that the first essay is called Writer as Activist. The first sentence is of what use is creative writing? And I thought that's a good place to start. And in this essay, you speak about the writer's intent. So would you like to elaborate a little bit about that? Um. I don't believe that the writer is an activist in the sense of, in the sense in which we see activism today, because I do believe that literature is something more than transient issues. It uh, is sort of involved with an examination of the human condition of life itself and of various other things, which one does through the lives of individuals. So it is, 
completely different from writing political, uh, you know, uh, in political journals or writing about the state of the country or, but there are times, you know, I remember this that uh, Nayantara Segal once said that there are times of national crisis when suddenly you feel the need to speak up. And I think that is the kind of thing which creates both the activism in the writer and problems for the writer. Because the world being what it is today, if you take a stand, you're immediately stamped as belonging to a certain group. You know, if I were to say that I don't believe in intoler intolerance is bad, be immediately dubbed as belonging, as being part of the opposition. Or if I were to say that, you know, liberal, liberal, liberalism is bad, I would be immediately called a BJP person. So it's so hard for uh, any thinker today to take up a stand and not be stamped as anything, you know. So as far as the writer is concerned, I think even in your writing, you don't take sides. You don't uh, sort of say this character is good, that character is bad. I mean, we have Jane Austen who has got a number of kind of nasty characters, Wickham is there, but she doesn't say they are bad. You know, I mean, it just comes through their actions. So for, if you were to speak as a person, not as a fiction writer, you would have to take a stand. And I think that is where a lot of writers do hesitate. And in our country, before independence, there are a lot of writers involved in the nation, in the national causes. I remember my father is a Kannada writer, Adirangacharya. I remember how involved he was with politics. I remember Shivram Karanth involved with politics. I, I don't know about the English writers. Um, I think R.K. Narayan was very distant from everything, but there was a strong sense of involvement and a nationalist spirit. After independence, I think people moved away from that and it became a kind of an individual uh, uh, sort of a search of an individual for something. In English writing, we have not had many people who've been involved with politics, except Nantara Segal who's been always, she was a journalist first, she's always been in the forefront. And that particular uh, thing which uh, Indira spoke of when I resigned, it was Nayantara Segal who took the first step by giving back her award to the Satya Academy when I think one man was killed for eating beef or something like that. So I didn't return my award. I was very clear about that. I, I thought my award has been given to me by a, uh, you know, a jury of writers and it mattered to me, it was precious. So I resigned from the academy and from all the boards I was part of. And that was a sign of protest against the complete silence of the academy on the killing of a writer. A writer who was part of the academy, who was on many committees, who was a writer who had received a Satya Academy Award. And it was sort of brushed under the carpet. And I'm not an active political person. I'm very wary of getting into anything which brings me under the spotlight like this. I, I don't like it. But it hurt me. I said, what's wrong with these people? I mean, here is a man who has been shot in his own home. And you don't even speak of it. I believe there was one meeting, in a sort of, a, what do you call it, a condolence meeting, where they spoke of it as a death, not a killing. So my friend wrote to me and said there was a meeting here, but they spoke of it as a as, an, as, as if it was a natural death. And I said, no, no, something wrong here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I resigned. But that is a particular kind of activism which sort of was taken up by a lot of people. And to me, the best thing was writers from all languages, from all the, over the country came together. That was a brief moment. Writers are not very good at activism, I have realized. There are writers who are very strong, but in fiction, you, you know, you can sort of slant and you don't come across as really being against someone or something. And I must also admit that writers do think, do I want to write something which will get me into trouble? Do I want to write something which will get my family into trouble? More than yourself with the family. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, it's sort of divided feeling. And I don't think any writer decides to become an activist. So you're pushed into it. You know, sometimes you just cannot stay silent. Silence is totally wrong in certain. So to me, the writer becomes, turns into not an activist, but turns into somebody who is dissenting with the authorities only when there is a real sort of feeling that this is wrong. So that's very profound, actually, because in a way, a writer has to 
um, hold on to their integrity while they're writing. Absolutely. And and I think you respond. One responds then when one feels strong. Moved, yes, yeah. moved to do so. Yeah. If uh, you will indulge me, I'd like to read just a little segment from sure. from from your uh, this essay. Um, and you say writers are themselves often stricken by doubt and at their most cynical and despairing moments might think of literature as being as a dissident Russian writer Sorokin called it just letters on paper. I remember my own anguished helplessness after what happened in Gujarat in 2002. What could I say who would listen. The truth is that the doubts are almost always only momentary. One would not be a writer if one did not believe in what one was doing. And I thank you for that. Well, I'd like, there are so many more um, questions I have about writing and, uh, and also about, about translation and about um, words and the subtlety of words and, um, sorry, uh, and the way in which they uh, can be oppressive, they can be, um, they can be, um, Subtle are often very aggressive indicators of power. Um, but since we have so many people here in the audience who are surely readers of your books, I thought that it would be very nice to um, actually talk about reading for a little bit and then maybe come back to other yeah. things about I writing. think reading is the first step. Yes. And uh, unless you read, you don't write. Yes. So for me, both my memoir and this book, uh, where, you know, I got a chance to talk about reading, about what reading meant to me, mm -hmm. and about the books I have loved. And I must say that I'm very pleased that a lot of young people, younger people, have been writing and saying that now these books are on my list. I'm going to read them. <laughs> they may or they may not. You know, this is uh, like Emma, you know, since Emma who was constantly making lists of books she was going to read, but she never did. But I'm going to hope these people read. So I think my interest first interest is reading yes and you have i think both in the memoir and also here you have a num uh, you have three essays here on reading i mean you have yeah. you allude to reading throughout the throughout many of your essays but you have the short personal history of reading why read and then you have this wonderful title wonderfully titled essay which is how to read or rather how not to read the writing of women <laughs> i love that <laughs> yes, um, but throughout you talk very much about uh, the books that have influenced you yeah. and uh, the way in which you read from even uh, as a young, young child, young woman, and then later more consciously as a writer yourself. So one of my questions is while you are writing, uh, do you tend to read simultaneously? Um. One of the things is that when you're writing, you don't read anything which comes close to what you're writing about. You avoid that. My father, who was a writer, read only detective novels when he was writing, but they were very far from his writing. Uh, I also, I generally have one book which I read and it's kept under my table. And whenever I start, before starting my writing, I go to that book, I read a bit of that book, but that has nothing to do with my writing. And I think, it's very strange, the connections between what you read and what you write is uh, so difficult to, you know, find that connection, but there is a connection. Like when I was writing, uh, I think that long silence, I don't remember, I was reading Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook. And I think there is some connection between, you know, the mind is very, very different. There, there is a kind of connection. And another book I was writing in the country of deceit, I think it was uh, Jane Austen. You know, there was a connection. For another book, there was Dickens. There was this Bleak House, which is, I think, one of his best books. And there was that search for the mother, uh, search for a person. I think that's a wonderful book. And it sort of haunted me, but it stayed behind. So reading uh, is very kind of indirect influence. There's never a direct influence, you know, but it is there. Like I've written in one of these essays about uh, David Copperfield, you know, that little line about how he was when he was nine years old, all alone from Monday to Saturday, nobody to guide me, nobody to speak to me, nobody to comfort me. I know, I mean, I literally, I can still get tears every time I read that sentence. So there are some wonderful sentences in reading, which are, which inspire a writer, not write the same way, but they tell you about the magic of words. 
And I think that's what I get from reading the, the magic of narrative, the magic of words, the magic of creating people who become so real to you. Tale of Two Cities, I think Dickens has written in the beginning that it was very hard for me to let go all these people. You know, they've been with me for so long. Exactly the feeling I get when I finish a novel. I have to let them go. And they've been so much a part of me that I've lived in their world for such a long time. So that is the kind of influence writing, reading has on writing. Yes. And um, um, you talk very much also about how creating these characters, but also reading, uh, actually reading about people who are not like yourself or who are going through difficulties that you didn't realize other people felt, uh, that can be very profound as well. Yeah, I think that comes from um, an essay yes. I read <clears throat> in which... Um, they say that uh, reading you know, enlarges your world. You see people in a different way and you see yourself in a different way. Like you are afraid of some of your traits, some of the uh, things you do. And when you see, read a book and you know that there are people who have the same kind of feeling, you feel good that you're not the only person in the world who's like that. So there's a kind of reaffirmation of your humanness when you read. There's a kind of understanding of human nature and problems when you read. But I don't think anyone reads for this. This is something which, you know, people who want to sort of talk about reading would write about. But you, know, you read, I think, mainly because it grips you, the book grips you. And for me, it is always the language, the people, the narration, and how much it holds me. You know, I'm sort of lost to the world when I'm reading something I enjoy. So. Reading does many things to you. And I think uh, I would not have been what I am not, I don't mean a writer, but I would not have been the kind of person I am if I had not read. I find it more and more as I grow older. I'm not trying to say that I'm better than other people, but my understanding is different from people who have never read anything and who only go by their personal experience. Whereas when I read, I go through so many experiences. I have the experiences of Shylock. I have the experiences of Cordelia. I have the experience. I have so many experiences. I know all that. I think it's very enriching. Let me say that. I feel much richer for having read all that. And therefore, my passionate this thing about reading in both in Listen to Me and in this book. And, and I have to say that um, uh, when you read a good novel or even a good short story, a good piece of work, uh, which is fictional particularly, uh, you get the sim a similar feeling akin to what you mentioned about, uh, I have to let these people go. When you step out of it, you're a little bit bereft, a little bit bewildered for a moment because you've been living in another parallel world. <laughs> that, that's a reader's uh, feeling. You don't want it to end, you know, so... In fact, I was reading about Sanskrit drama, and uh, Sanskrit drama says that uh, it should never end in tragedy. It should always be a happy ending. Uh, and unfortunately, I, we would, all readers would love a happy ending. It doesn't fit many times. And you know, re writers have to have integrity towards the story. I think that is a very important thing, that there's a soul of the novel. And to that soul, you have an integrity. You can't I mean, I'm not talking of writing which is done for commercial, uh, you know, uh, purposes. I don't know whether I should use the word purposes, but which the author wants to sell. But when you're writing something which comes deep out of your guts, your soul, your heart, you have to respect the integrity of what you're writing. Now, um, um, as many of you may know or may not know, I, uh, I'm a short story writer, and uh, you write wonderful short stories, but in, you have said uh, many times that it's the novel that's your, uh, that's the one that holds you. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about the difference between writing a novel and a difference between writing a short story for you? Yeah, I, I always say that the short story is a 100 meter sprint, and the novel is a marathon. You know, that is the thing about the novel. It takes years of your time. For me, it's about three to four years. Uh, before the, the computers came, it was five to six years. And uh, all that time, you're living in that world. You're not living in uh, this world at all. So it's very hard. You don't want to get out of that world. And you have to struggle to find time. And you got to, if you have a break to go back to it, it's extremely difficult. So the novel in that way is much more demanding. 
short story also can be demanding. I wrote one short story which took me 16 years to write. Not that I was writing it all the time, but it was not right. I used to take it, put it, uh, try to write, put it away, take it, write, put it away. So after 16 years, I wrote that novel. And I'm, I'm not, I was not very happy with that either. So I think both are in their own ways, you know, there's one uh, essay on the short story here. So I, I think the short story is a beautiful form. And I must uh, tell Indira that I seem to have gone back to the short story now. For many, nearly 30 years I wrote only novels. I just could not write a short story. When you asked me to write for out of print, I said, I don't write short stories now. But now it's coming back to me. I do not know why or how, but I'm hugely thankful. Maybe because I can no longer run marathons. So short story is so much better. Well, I'm so grateful that you are writing short stories. And we have, uh, in fact, the opening um, story in the out of print anthology. Pardon me for making a small plug for the anthology. Oh, one, yeah, has to, yeah. one has to use what one can. Yeah. But uh, the opening story in the out of print anthology is, in fact, your story on uh, from the Mahabharata told from the point of view of Ambika. Yeah. And one of the things I felt when you were talking about the novel and how, in a way, you really sort of get so immersed in it and and it's... Uh, you know, you, you are you are in their world. Um, the one thing that struck me about this and another story of yours that we have that will be published soon is that um, you've created a whole world in those short stories, in those few words also, you know, because um, of, it's almost like you've, we're reliving the Mahabharata uh, in through those stories. And so um, in a sense, I feel that... Uh, um, I'm so glad you're back to the short story because you are you are a wonderful short story oh, writer. <laughs> and 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 as I said, you know, some people in a short story, they, they it's a very essential kind of thing. They it's extremely brief, and um, they tell you they just give you a sense of uh, they allude to something that's happening, a situation. But in yours, you really are creating a whole world, and so it's very special. I like I, oh, I very you. much thank appreciate you. that. But speaking of forms, the um, the essay. So um, I have um, one is you know you you started writing essays, but I have a question which I don't know if you will be able to answer, and maybe it's presumptuous of me to ask in a way. But um, when did you first begin to feel that um, your essays would be something that 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 your opinion about something you would wish to share it yeah, with? I think that's a very good question because. Um, well, it's very difficult to imagine that your opinions matter unless you have um, a very high regard for yourself, which I have never had. And uh, But there were so many things, and for me it was very clear. There's no room for any kind of opinion of mine in a novel or in a short story. I do not belong there. I do not write about myself. I do not put in my opinions, which is why uh, the... A lot of people are puzzled by my statement that I'm a feminist, but I'm not a feminist writer. Because when I write, I don't bring feminist write fiction. I don't bring feminism into it. So I was very clear that when I want to write my opinion, it has to be nonfiction. And I think for some time, uh, sometime in the 90s, I think thankfully due to the Academy Award, I don't know what, uh, I found that uh, pe people were ready to accept my uh, pieces and I could send them to a number of places sometimes commission sometimes just send now I no longer get commission maybe I'm too old they think this is an old lady can't write anymore so I, I, I I'm still writing but I don't know where they'll go but you know like Indira said I think you have to be you have to feel that your opinion matters and you have to feel that it not only it opinion matters you got to put it out there you know, that was the feeling I had for a number of essays that I've written. Reading and writing, of course, I thought that, you know, um, I'm going to sort of write about them because they're part of my world. But when we were doing this collection, there's one essay which is called Macaulay's People. That was a different essay. And it was about, uh, no, not Macaulay's, or writers and critics. Ah, yes. ah, yeah, I think I like that essay, you know, because I think it says a lot which writers want to say, but never can. So uh, I remember Dieter, one of the uh, persons who helped me compile this, he told me, I don't see anyone in India who has written about this kind of a thing. So, you know, I felt very pleased and I sort of 
rewrote it and made it a little more comprehensive. And I'm very pleased with that because I've got my own, I've got back at the critics, <laughs> which you never get to do when you're an author. You know, they write a lousy kind of a review and you can't say anything. So yeah, I thought, okay, here's my chance. And you know, it's not nasty. I mean, I wouldn't write anything nasty, but it's an author's point of view. So I love the bit in that where you talk about discovering your old uh, the paper newspaper cuttings that yeah, you yeah, found, yeah. <laughs> and you thought, oh, why have I kept all these? Uh, you know, cuttings <laughs> right from my first novel. When we moved house from a large house to an apartment, like most people do after a certain stage, and he piles of them, yellowing, crumpling, and I said, why have I kept this? So I, you know, I sort of sat with the whole thing and said, I better throw it out. Then I thought, not all of them, so I said, keep some good ones. And as good ones meaning those which said good things about my writing. So, you know, ultimately I kept all those good ones and threw out all the bad ones, which was good for me. So I'm now free of the burden of hating all those critics who said bad things about me. You know, that was nice. I'll just yeah. Yeah, I'll just support it. Yeah, this one. This is fine. This is okay. Yeah, you please ask them. Yes, I will. Um, Yes, so thank you for that. Um, the other, the other thing that I uh, I loved about your collection. So the the collection is divided into different sections, and the last one is about uh, places and memories and places visited. And uh, since we are in Bangalore, actually, you have a lovely little comment uh, where, when in one of your Bangalore essays where you say Bangaloreans, um, I'm paraphrasing, uh, love to. Uh, um, abbreviate or make antonyms of things. So we are at the BLF at BIC. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, um, it's wonderful actually reading about a sort of the evolution, though I don't know if evolution is the right word because evolution somehow indicates uh, maybe because of uh, Darwin and maybe because of our, our Christian uh, uh, kind of idea that uh, we are all the, the, the human being is at the top of the heap, <laughs> but um, but in any way, you think if evolution means a, towards a better sort of uh, place. But in any case, the change in Bangalore as you changed and evolved as a writer, and and then um, lived through. Uh, lived through this changing city. It's wonderful, actually, and it's very evocative. And then you have another essay on global Bangalore, yeah. which is, uh, but I think before we get to those, I think one of the essays that I found utterly charming um, and somehow very, very uh, lovely was also the uh, one on your visit to the Gurvayur temple, because oh, it Gurvayur. is, yes, yeah. because it's uh, just a very responsive essay, you know, okay. it's not a, uh, you're just talking about how you're responding to everything that is happening around, it was okay. a very lovely essay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so do you, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, Bangalore? And I know you just recently did as well, talked about how Bangalore changed before your eyes and you changed with it as you moved through different neighborhoods. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, there was a time when uh, Bangalore was much talked about, I think in the 90s, and there used to be a lot of uh, discussions about Bangalore. And then somebody would say, uh, I've been, a ba been in Bangalore for many years and I would uh, try to think how many years, and they would say, I've been here for 10 years or five years. And me with my 40 years, I used to say, my God, what are they talking about? What do they know of Bangalore? Well, I know Bangalore from 1956, I think, yeah. My dad came here in 56, I came in 56. I left in 62 when I got married, and then came back in 75 when my husband joined Nimads. It's been a very long stay in Bangalore. And um, it's home now. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, it's very familiar, very homely. And my always my curiosity is about the different Bangalores. You know, we lived in Malishwaram, that is one Bangalore. Then you go to Basangudi, that's another Bangalore. You go to the cantonment, that's another Bangalore. You go to Shivaji Nagar, that's another. I mean, the kind of self-contained groups. So that is now, I think, sort of being broken. I did not like the earlier thing, you know, all the Tamils here, all the Christians there, all the Kannadas here. I never liked that kind of a thing. But I, I don't think I'm very happy about this. Uh, the people who are being left out are the people who are not able to afford uh, staying in the confines of the city. So you've got to go very far away. And I have my maids who tell me when they don't have a house, 
ದೂರ ಹೋಗ್ಬೇಕು ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಹೋದ್ರೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಸಿಗೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಯು ನೋ ಸೊ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ನಾವ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಲಿಟಲ್ ಅನ್ಎಫೋರ್ಡೇಬಲ್ ಫಾರ್ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಬಟ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ವಿ ಕೇಮ್ ಯ ಇನ್ ಬಾಂಬೆ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ವೇ ಟು ಕಮ್ ಯ my husband's uh, boss the dean of km hospital told him certainly you should go to bangalore because it's a place where even a middle class person can live a dignified life and i've never forgotten that and i think it's still true to some extent you know bombay i loved because of its kind of what to say bustling you know i i loved the bustle of bombay and bombay made me a writer i saw people living hard lives i saw you know the working people i saw the we lived in the middle of parel is full of factories at that time so th- that made me a writer looking at people there when i came here it took me a long time to get into bangalore as a writer came here in 75 and the first novel i wrote about bangalore was in the 90s it took me 20 years to locate myself in bangalore so bangalore did not give me that sense of excitement which bombay gave me but gave me a, now it's given me a sense of comfort i belong here and uh, you know um, i like the way the sort of people are happy to speak any like language chauvinism is something which disturbs me a lot you know i mean we we speak kannada i mean I, my father was a kannada writer but i don't like this going around and blacking out you know english board and that is not bangalore that is not bangalore you know this i don't know how where it has come i think politicians have spoiling the city they're spoiling everything why not a city so you know it makes me sad because bangalore is such a tolerant place you know whole kempegowda road with all tamil movies there was no kannada movies then just imagine what today's uh, world would do to that and huge cutouts of shivaji ganeshan and whoever the actors were you know, wearing the shivaji ganeshan wearing those tights and carrying a sword in his hand marvelous cutouts i've never forgotten them and those luscious heroines you know absolutely luscious you know their whole body their hair their flowers so we, it, it was all tamil there was no kannada at all and we had that time five languages in bangalore movies even today we have them but i think uh, maybe kannada is trying to sort of maybe kannada people have been kind of underestimated have been a little put down because even here it was the tamilians so who had uh, you know because of the maharajas uh, whatever they were so i think they are getting aggressive now which is not really what kannada people are yes. yeah. but you know i mean since we're talking about language one of the things that's very interesting is uh, how english is viewed uh, in the writing community and uh, as for for writers and uh, you know there's a whole sort of field as it were of iwe since we are using acronyms yeah. uh, indian writing in english um so when you started writing here in bangalore uh, how was your uh, uh, writing received by other writers did you feel a certain yes there were very few uh, writers in english in bangalore at that time i remember just maybe five or six i don't remember many of them and i was very isolated anyway from all other writers so i i don't know how it was but um for some reason i think there was a lot of hostility against english writers in general you know from the language writers and that was what uh, was kind of disturbing for me and particularly because i am the daughter of a very well known kannada writer i remember when i got the academy award and uh, they have one session called the author talks about uh, you know firstly about that and i got a letter saying there's a session in which the author will talk about himself about his experiences his writing etc etc his his so when i went there i asked uh, the secretary i said what is this his his i will not am i not i'm not a he obviously i'm not going to take part in this you know oh, it never occurred to me you know that's the trouble it never occurs to anyone that they are doing wrong thing so anyway there was this session and uh, you know uh, it, it was kind of uh, where we had to talk about ourselves so i just said people asked me the question why do you write in english when your father is a kannada writer and a quite a lot of yeah, people at the back started saying yes why tell us why tell us why you know it was so aggressive and i wasn't very equipped to sort of stand up to the aggression then you know i sort of ignored it the same thing happened in nimrana when we went there you know it was such an anti english writing there i don't blame them because the whole thing was sort of 
uh, shaped towards English writing. Everything was shaped towards, and you had Naipaul as the center of it all, you know, the, the, the jewel in the crown, so to say. And you had all these people getting the Booker Awards and all that. So now I think, thanks to all the young people who are writing in English, who are doing well in English, that is gone. Nobody questions you, why do you write in English? I bet nobody asks Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, why do you write in English? It's taken for granted, which is a very good thing. And the other good thing the young people have done is that they are earning money in India. They don't have to sell abroad. You know, I think for two things, I applaud them very much. Both these things were very difficult in my time. Unless you were published abroad, you didn't matter. I was published by Virago, a feminist press. And then I sort of came into the, you know, uh, sort of eyes of some of the people here that here is a writer. And that was when Bangalore knew uh, somebody from one of the papers, was it Reconcilers? I don't know, Indian Express. But I believe that you live in Bangalore. You know? <laughs> so uh, it, it's not a very pleasant thing, but I think it's over. Yeah. Yes, that is good to know, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and it has uh, taken its place as a sort of a valid voice, I think. Absolutely, correct. Along with all the other yeah. languages yeah. in India as a literary language. So yeah. that's really nice. Now, um, I really do urge everyone to go out and get this and also to get listened to me if you want to know about uh, Shashi Deshpande's uh, thinking and ideas uh, as a writer and a reader. Um, one of the beautiful essays, I mean, there are many lovely essays here, and it's really a tribute to the form, I think, as well, because um, uh, to read this entire set of essays uh, together, you really do feel as if you're following somebody's thinking. So it's it's a wonderful, really, actually, wonderful Thank collection. You. And one of the essays I really liked very much is your closing, or almost closing essay on Virginia Woolf. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's uh, such a nice, um, uh, it's a short essay. And yeah. it's, yes, it's lovely. Yeah, that's a short because... Uh, I used to write for this uh, uh, magazine called First City. They were one of the people who gave me a very steadily space to write and about writers. So I have Steinbeck, I have Virginia Woolf, you know, and Virginia Woolf, she was more interested in my writing about the room of one's own rather than Virginia Woolf. And I'm sorry that maybe I should have enlarged it, but that wouldn't have been honest because what I published was this one. Yes. So um, I think she was the greatest, uh, she has been next to Jane Austen, the greatest influence on me, because she gave me the courage to think that I'm what I write matters. But because I was made to feel all the time since I'm a woman and I write about women, I don't matter. It went on for a very long time and could have stopped my writing actually, but um, that I didn't is partly due to my own, you know, what to say, um, defiance. I mean, somebody tells me, don't do a thing, I'm going to do it. So that was one thing. And the other thing was Virginia Woolf. Yeah. You know, I mean, her room of one's own, such a convincing argument, uh, which sort of just demolishes all these uh, theories that women's writing is about unimportant matters. It's about, you know, matters which are very trivial. So I think that is for me, Virginia Woolf. And I'd love to write another sometime about her. Oh, more. that would be yeah. wonderful. I'm going to uh, just read a little line from it, sure. which is uh, which is actually where you make a line, uh, make a comment based on her comment. And um, um, her statement, that is Virginia Woolf's statement, if you consider any great figure of the past, like Sappho, like Emily Bronte, you will find that she is an inheritor as well as an originator, close quotes. And then Shashi Deshpande says, this made me aware of the great truth that there is a chain of writers and all of us are inheritors as well as originators. And I think that's just a wonderful. Absolutely. I think that's the truth about the writing that you never stand on your own. I always see it as a long chain of writers. Yes. And, you know, we, I mean, one of the things about writing in English has been that uh, people do not owe anything to the past. Present writers, I mean, I've written about an essay written by um, what's this, um, what's her name? I'm sorry, first time I'm, anyway, it was, it is, it is on, uh, on beauty. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so it is like Howard's, uh, you know, Howard's. And, I, and, you know, that kind of continuity which you take from a writer, 
is not there. You have breaks, and Meenakshi Mukherjee said that mm -hmm. that uh, there's a kind of amnesia about English writing. Mm -hmm. yes. So each generation forgets his past. past. Yes. Well, um, thank you. That really, yeah. it really, it's been such a, a pleasure for me to read these essays, thank and you. it's a wonderful form and wonderful collection. And um, and as I said, reading it, uh, following, listen to me, uh, it makes a wonderful uh, sort of um, exposure to your writing and your thinking. Um, now we'll open up to questions. Uh, there's one right in the front row. I'm a 21 year old. And I, when I first read um, Shashi Desh Monday, I was 19. And that was decades after the writing was done. And I could still relate to a lot of things that you spoke about that women face. That, that just makes me think about like the progression of the Indian feminist movement. Mm -hmm. And especially with the sort of political climate that um, I live in today, mm -hmm. how do you see the future of Indian feminist movement? Because I probably shouldn't be relating to so many things that women in 1970s, 80s like <laughs> related to because like I'm so young. <laughs> So she, uh, so uh, to to uh, make that short, the um, the Indian feminist movement and the thing, the comments that uh, she responded to in your writing, uh, which uh, she still responds to now, so many years after it was written. So, uh, how, uh, what is the future of the Indian feminist movement if uh, uh, from the seventies to now to when she first read your books? Uh, Nothing seems to have changed. The independence is, movement. The Indian feminist movement. Oh, feminist movement. Oh, yes. Okay. Is that a good uh, summary of your question? Yeah, there, there's been a, a huge change. I think certainly uh, things have not really improved. Just see what happened in the Karnataka Assembly the other day. It is such a disgusting thing. And the fact that nobody's taken any action against those men is to me the most shocking thing of all. So I think women have changed, men haven't. That's the problem, you know. That's the basic problem. We need men to change. So how do we do that? I think it's for you young people to figure out. Hello, ma'am. My name is Siddhi. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights to us. It was really great. I'm feeling really inspired. My question to you is, uh, how do you step over the writer's block that you face? or? any uh, challenge that you face while writing, any frequent challenge that you face while writing, how do you come over that? It's a writing block, right. yeah. Um, the, the <clears throat> writing block fascinates a lot of people. I'm often asked this question. I'm not sure that I've ever experienced writing block excepting recently, but I consider that due to COVID, um, my age, and also a bit of a tragedy in the family. So even despite that, I do continue to write. And uh, if it's bad, I just throw it out, but I do not stop writing because that is my way of living. So it depends on how important writing is to you. For me, writing is therapy. Writing is catharsis. For me, writing is living. So when it's that important, you know, and the time may come when I may no longer be able to write because of age, but one has to accept that. Age uh, takes its toll. And so many activities go, but at a younger age, if you can't write, I would just rather put it away. And I remember Kushwan Singh once telling me that if he could not write, he used to translate. Mm -hmm. He said that would be a good, I agree with that. I've also done some translation. Mm -hmm. So writing goes on, maybe in a different form. And one should not worry about writer's block. I think if you can't write, it's okay. You should you know, take a break. It'll come time. back. I remember one of, uh, my friends who is in a very big position said due to my position I can no longer write I said but you're having so many experiences it'll all come back to you yes you know every experience in life is part of a writer's material so I wouldn't worry about that thank you ma'am thank you so much yeah, we we talked about uh, relevance of writing you started the statement about you know what is the relevance of writing and you know whether writers are activists and stuff like that and today we see some kind of dystopia, whether it comes to democracy or the nature of the environment and so on and so forth. Yes, so my question is, uh, what is what is that you see? What is the significance of writing? What is the significance of authors? Do you see any hope of any change? 
What is the significance of writing in 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 this dystopic reality you're right, saying? Right, right. Okay, you know you should read the essays, but <laughs> <laughs> what is the significance of writing or being a writer in in this very dystopic reality where things are? Do you see any? Do you I see think any it's, hope? It is fine. really the only thing. If you ask me, it is the thing because it's only through writing that you understand. Even I, when I start writing, I'm, I'm not very really clear about my ideas. As I go on writing, I understand. So it is through writing you get an understanding of why things are the way they are. And I would say that it is very important, the worse the condition of the world, the more important it is, both reading and writing. And on no other art form uh, gives you this because uh, this is cerebral. You know, painting and music would be uh, cerebral to a small extent. Maybe to a greater extent, I do not know, but the writing is directly on the spot. Uh, hi, I'm James. Hi. Um, earlier, you talked about <coughs> excuse me, uh, letting go of characters, and you talked about the um, 16 year short story. Can you talk a little bit about um, beginnings and endings and how you know when you've committed to a story and you're going to continue with it, and how you know? Um, Okay, it's time to let these characters go. It's over. You want to tell me again? <laughs> yes, the beginnings and endings. So uh, the idea that these characters are with you. How do you know when it's time to let them go? Yes. Uh, I think you, uh, letting them go is different from stopping the story. You know, the story comes to an end because it winds down. As you're writing, you can feel the winding down. And many times the ending is extremely difficult. The beginning is even more difficult actually, but uh, the ending is very hard, but you have to end. All stories have to come to an end. You don't let go the people then, even though the story, they live with you, they stay with you. And there's some characters who don't let go for years. Like I wrote a novel called the, the, In the Country of Deceit. There's a character who for 20 years had been nagging at me and telling me, write about me, write about me. So finally I wrote it. I thought it wasn't a great novel, but for me it was an achievement because I was happy I had sort of satisfied my character and wrote about her. So uh, I know I'm sure we would like to hear much more from Ms. Deshpande. Thank you for, again, I, I use the word generous. It's very generous when you share your... Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you for being here.